protected areas are just terrestrial islands, mm -hmm. which is a part of conservation area, but the rest of the area is con converted to agriculture right. area, settlement, or any other means. Mm -hmm. So uh, this tells us maybe some species are uh, to the future shift somewhere, mm -hmm. and if we come across on that information, and that area is totally converted to other land use, what can be a conservation action? For yeah, us? well, so you have two choices in, in the world of climate change, really. Uh, species are going to be moving, and so if you have natural habitat outside of your protected areas, you can add to your protected areas to, to pick them up where they're moving to. But if you have nothing outside of your existing protected areas, then you have to manage the species within the protected areas, okay? So those are really the two f options you have. And so this is an example of a case where we do have areas outside our existing protected areas and can add additional uh, area to the national protected area system. And that's still happening here, so it's possible in some places here, but it may not be possible in every place. Um, but if you remember, and we can't see the gray areas very well, the gray areas here are the existing agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if the Cape is a big, huge area, it has huge areas of natural area left. Most of the Cape is converted to agriculture as well. And so we have the smaller white areas that are still in natural habitat, and those are the areas we're choosing from. So we're not asking for agricultural land to be converted back to natural habitat. We're just saying, where would we choose uh, to put additional protection in the natural habitat that we have to, to compensate for climate change? Um, and what, so what you find, and I just wanted to go back through this to illustrate these principles of persistence and representation, and to remind people that if we're trying to represent species, it's usually not just one small population and one protected area somewhere. We'd like to have multiple representations of that target. Um, but so let's look then at what the, this reserve selection algorithm tells us about where we might put new protection to capture species movements in the cave. And the first thing to notice is that most of the areas that it's suggesting are right next to existing protected areas. Okay, and why is that? Why aren't, well, it's for the same reason last time that we said that we're not building a big corridor between West Coast National Park and, and the Cedarburg. And if, if you remember, we had a species that started in West Coast National Park, but wound up in the Cedarburg. And we said, well, it didn't seem like a very good idea to try to build a corridor between West Coast National Park across all this agricultural land and up to the Cedarburg to capture that change. But in fact, what made sense was to take populations that are near the Cedarburg now and will be have suitable climate within the Cedarburg in the future and use those as the, um, as the areas for that species. So if we look at that, we can look at that again. And so that's exactly what this animation is showing is that this reserve selection algorithm the, and the red dots indicate the grid cells that the algorithm selecting for this particular species. So the, the places that it's selecting for this species are places here in the picket bird where the species currently exists and where it'll exist in the future. So there it's just looking pretty much for pla places and that's a mountain range so the species can move up slope a little bit and still be captured. And so that's the area that it looks for in the Picketburg, and then up in the Cedarburg, again, it's looking for areas that are right next to the Cedarburg, because by 2050, the Cedarburg's gonna be very good habitat for that species. So if we can just get those populations that are near the Cedarburg protected now, we'll have continuous protection from, 20, from the present through 2050. And so these dark green areas then are the additional areas that let you represent the species in all time steps from the present through till 2050. And again, 
Uh, some of them are right, little isolated areas because the species only exist there, but many of them are just right next to existing protected areas for the same reason that they're next to the cedar bird. If we can get a little bit of extra protection for a population near where it's going to have good future habitat, then the protected area makes up most of the future change for the species, takes care of most of the representation in the future, and we just need to, to find a place that has a, a population that we can protect now to get it to where it'll be in the future. And the, the, the reserve selection algorithm, the optimization program in this case, actually just answers the question, well, where are the best places to do that when you consider all possible chains for all possible species? And that's what generates this pattern of green dots. Now, this may or may not be a very realistic pattern of places you could put protected areas. Many of these places near existing protected areas might be really easy to annex to existing protected areas. Some of the areas may be just little isolated patches of habitat that are too small to really make a protected area. And so once you have an initial plan like this, you need to go back through and begin to look at areas that you think you could actually protect. And that will change what the optimization algorithm says, and you'd have to run it again and then see what areas then become the first priority for protection um, to get a, mi a minimum uh, area answer to your problem. Okay, so that's late in the day to do everything we talked about, about reserve selection and for climate change. Uh, but that's the process that you'd go through. Um, any questions about that? Yeah, Michael. Oh, sorry, i got to come to you. Yes. No, uh, the diversity is very big. The diversity of species. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question is, there are a lot of species, and what are the criteria we use to design our protected area system? So in this particular example, uh, we had models for 300 proteas, and that's a good proportion of the proteas, and they're very important. They're one of the three main plant groups that make this region so important. So those were a, a sort of a fortuitously small number of targets that we had, right? But if you're in a rainforest, then you're going to have a lot more species and you're going to have to probably make some choices about conservation targets because you won't be able to plan for all of your targets. And then as Town was discussing yesterday, you won't have data for all of your targets either. You may know that you want to conserve a species, but it may, you may want to conserve it because it's only known from one place or one collection in the world. In which case, you don't have any data about where that species is except for its type location. And you're going to have to decide how you, know, you design a, a conservation plan that captures that species in the present, but also you know, something about how you might estimate that it would be viable for climate change. So it can get much more complicated than this. But the, I, it's a really good question because here I've just said we're doing all 300 proteus species. But if you were assigned this in real life, you also have to choose your target species to do this, and that's part of representation. You choose your targets, and then you, you get, get them represented and, and get them to persist. Other questions? Uh, yes. I would say, we like to summarize the work of climate change mm -hmm. objectives. It's only monitoring of the many solutions for the extension of some, uh, for example, plans. Yeah, so the question is, is, is climate change planning just about modeling or are there other approaches that you can yeah. use? And the answer to that is there, other, and it's a good question because that's about what we're gonna go into, is background about climate change that will help us understand um, many other sorts of approaches to thinking about conservation for climate change besides modeling. Yeah. So modeling is important in climate change because nobody really knows what the future is going to be. And so we need to use climate change models and models of species changes with climate change. Uh, but it's certainly not the only way, and in many cases, not the best way to be planning for climate change. Um, OK, anything else, or should we? So we'll do a couple of sessions of background information about climate change. And I'm going to take you way back today, and we're going to look into sort of climate change in deep time 
things that we'll look at for climate change is what's happened um, in the past with climate change, what's currently going on, and then we'll talk a bit about how we think about the future through experimental results and modeling. So, could you predict its climate changes? Can we predict? Predict. No, change? predict is a word that climate change people will never use. We can simulate the future, we can project possible futures, but we can't predict the future any more than the weatherman can tell you exactly what the weather's going to be tomorrow, right? And, you know, for very similar reasons. We, we use, as I mentioned, we use exactly the same kinds of models that weather forecasting uses. Well, we know that weather forecasting is getting better and better. I mean, at least in my lifetime, I believe the weather forecast for tomorrow and the next day much more than I used to. It used to be, I think, a better weather forecast was just tomorrow will be like today. Mm -hmm. But the models are getting better. They, they're getting pretty sophisticated about modeling storm patterns and what's happening with precipitation. Mm -hmm. And they understand what happens as land masses cool and oceans warm and cool. And so they get temperatures pretty well. Uh, but you don't really trust them 10 days out very often. And certainly, you know, beyond that, you, you, you use it very cautiously. Um, so that's all true of, of climate change as well. We're dealing with models. Thank you. It's, a it's a way to get information, but it's not predicting for sure. Okay, so we will leave the models behind there now, possibly to everyone's relief. And we'll take, but we're going to go, as I say, back in time and start way back, sort of about 500 million years ago, to think about. And so, Here's our storyline for this, is that you've now taken this reserve plan to your boss, and your boss has looked at it and he goes, well, look at all these new areas you're proposing. You know, this is going to cost a lot of money, and I've got to take it to the minister, and he's going to have to take it to the prime minister and sell this. And so if you want me to rally support for your protected areas plan, you better learn all there is to know about climate change so that you can defend this plan to the minister and explain to him why we think climate change is real and why we think it's going to really move species and ecosystems around and what we're going to have to do about it. So in order to get there, let's uh, take a look at some background about what's been happening with climate change in the past. and what may happen in the future. So we'll just, it's late today, we're just going to get through a quick look at the past or not. There we go. Um, and then we'll pick up uh, in looking at current changes around the world and uh, some management challenges. So this is a representation from 500 million years ago to the present. So this is like, you know, way back in Earth history. And the question that I want to use this chart to illustrate is just the question of whether climate change and extinctions are always linked. So the climate change is represented on this chart by the blue line, which is roughly an approximation of how paleoecologists, paleoclimatologists think global mean temperature looked uh, throughout 